subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from our UPSC Civil Services examination perspective. Now today, let us take up the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 24th March 2022. Now these are the list of the news which we will be taking up for today's discussion. And timestamping for these news has been provided in the YouTube description. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from our prelims and main point of view. Today's weekly mains question for practice is from the DNS dated 15th March 2022. The DNS discussed about the microfinance sector. So the question is, the Indian microfinance presents a story of strong growth, but it is constrained by many challenges. Discuss. And this question carries 15 marks. So you can go through this particular DNS to answer this particular question as a part of your weekly assignment for mains question for practice. Now this news appears in the text and context section on page number 10. So this news highlights about the controversy with respect to the Mekedatu water project. So it says the controversy over the proposed Mekedatu water project. And why is this drinking water project a source of confrontation between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu? And why are both parties unable to come to a settlement? So this article talks about the confrontation between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka with respect to sharing of the river Kaveri water. So the gist of this news says that both Karnataka and Tamil Nadu are at loggerheads over the Mekedatu drinking water project across the river Kaveri. Now this project is not only with respect to drinking water but also to generate electricity. So it says that Tamil Nadu's assembly has passed a resolution against this particular project while Karnataka's legislative assembly is set to counter such resolution of Tamil Nadu with its own resolution seeking the project's early implementation and clearance. And in this regard, Karnataka government has even asked the central government to provide for early clearance of this particular project. So regarding the Meki Datu project, it highlights that this is a drinking water come power generation project proposed by Karnataka over the river Kaveri. Now this becomes an important fact from your prelims perspective which you must remember that this project is both a drinking water project and also a power generation project. And this 9000 crore balancing reservoir at Mekedatu on Karnataka Tamil Nadu border envisages impounding of 67.15 thousand million cubic feet of water. So, the whole confrontation or the whole tussle between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu is regarding sharing of this river water of Kaveri. Now, both sides have given their arguments. Karnataka has said that since the project falls inside its own jurisdictional limit, hence Tamil Nadu's permission for the project is not needed. Further, the Karnataka government has also stated that Supreme Court or High Court has not put a stay on the Meke Datu project so far and hence it has all the right to carry on with the functioning of this particular project. However, Tamil Nadu on the other hand has opposed such project stating that it will impact the flow of river Kaveri. Now this topic becomes important both from the perspective of environment under GS paper 3 and it also gets covered under GS Paper 2 regarding statutory bodies, regulatory and various quasi-judicial bodies. Further, it also gets covered with respect to functions and responsibilities of state government and issues and challenges pertaining to the federal structure as well. So we have already seen the purpose of the Mekedatu project that it is a drinking water project and also a hydropower project. And so far, the screening committee of Central Water Commission had given in principle clearance to prepare detailed project report by Karnataka with respect to the Mekedatu project. And the copies of such detailed project report has been forwarded to Central Water Commission and also the Kaveri Water Management Authority. Now the Kaveri Water Management Authority was constituted based on the Supreme Court judgment of 2018 which decided the sharing of river water of Kaveri 
between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And the Kaveri Water Management Authority has been constituted as per Section 6A of Interstate River Water Disputes Act. So, the government of Tamil Nadu has opposed the Mekedatu project in the meeting of Kaveri Water Management Authority and has also passed a resolution in its state assembly against this particular project. Now, another concern with respect to this project is that this project will lead to submergence of almost 5100 hectares of Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary and because of this clearance from the Expert Appraisal Committee on River Valley and Hydroelectric Projects is also needed. Now this Expert Appraisal Committee has been constituted by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and has stated that the project can be considered only after Tamil Nadu and Karnataka reach an amicable solution. Now this seems very unlikely and because of this the appraisal is also stuck. Now the expert appraisal committee is constituted both at the central level and also at the state level and this is constituted based on a 2006 notification with respect to environment impact assessment and this notification was issued by the ministry of environment forest and climate change. So presently the Mekedatu project is before the Kaveri Water Management Authority. Now as I have already stated that this authority has been constituted with respect to section 6A of Interstate River Water Disputes Act. So in order to implement the decision of Supreme Court of 2018 regarding the sharing of Kaveri River water, the central government under section 6A of this act notified Kaveri Water Management Scheme and this scheme constituted two important bodies namely the Kaveri Water Management Authority and second the Kaveri Water Regulation Committee and this was done to give effect to the decision of the Kaveri Water Disputes Tribunal which was later modified by the Honorable Supreme Court judgment of February 2018. Now, Section 6A of Interstate River Water Disputes Act provides for power to make schemes to implement decision of the tribunal. And in this regard, the Kaveri Water Management Scheme was constituted or notified. So, it says that the central government by notification in official gazette frame a scheme or schemes whereby provision may be made for all matters necessary to give effect to the decision of the tribunal. So, since the Supreme Court was hearing the decision of Kaveri Water Disputes Tribunal, hence after the judgment of Supreme Court, this particular scheme was constituted under Section 6A of this particular Act. Now talking about the functions and powers of the Kaveri Water Management Authority, it says that this authority shall exercise all such power and discharge all such duty to do all things necessary, sufficient and expedient to secure compliance and implementation of the award of the tribunal as modified by the Honorable Supreme Court. And these functions of the authority includes storage, apportionment, regulation and control of Kaveri waters, supervision of operation of reservoirs and with regulation of water releases therefrom. Further, regulated release by Karnataka at interstate contact point presently identified as Beligundulu Gorge and discharge station located on the common border of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. So basically, it ensures proper sharing of river water between the two states as per the judgment of Supreme Court of India. So as you can see in this map, this is where the Mekedatu project is located which is very close to the border of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and this is the flow of river Kaveri. Now the Karnataka government has envisaged the Mekedatu project to provide drinking waters to the citizens of Bangalore and also people living in surrounding areas and also to generate 400 megawatt of hydroelectric power. And regarding Mekadatu, it says that it is a deep gorge situated at the confluence of rivers Kaveri and its tributary Akravati. And the construction activities include Mekadatu Balancing Reservoir, a bridge, powerhouse, tail race tunnel, approach road and also a colony. So, the objective of Mekadatu Balancing Reservoir and Drinking Water Project is basically 
to utilize the additional water to provide drinking water facility to citizens of Bangalore and also in the adjoining area. And this will be done by proposing a scheme to tap water from the foreshore of the intended Meke Datu Balancing Reservoir and Drinking Water Project. Further, to regulate the required quantum of water to Tamil Nadu on a monthly basis. And this will be done as per the decision of Supreme Court of India. Further, it also aims to store the flood waters which would have otherwise keep to sea. And it aims to harness nearly 400 megawatts of renewable energy annually, namely the hydroelectric power. So from our discussion, these are some of the prelims pointers which you must remember. These are the Kaveri Water Management Authority is constituted as part of Kaveri Water Management Scheme under Section 6A of Interstate River Water Disputes Act of 1956. Next, the Expert Appraisal Committee has been constituted both at the level of centre and also at state under Environment Impact Assessment Notification of 2006 to provide for environmental clearance for various projects affecting the environment. Next, the Central Water Commission is not a statutory body and functions as an attached office of Ministry of Jal Shakti, Department of Water Resources, River Development and Ganga Rejuvenation. So please remember this aspect as well. Next, the work of CWC, that is Central Water Commission, is divided among three wings, namely Designs and Research Wing, River Management Wing and Water Planning and Projects Wing. Next, the Mekadatu project aims at providing drinking water facilities to Bangalore metropolitan area and also its surroundings. And also, it aims to generate 400 megawatt of hydroelectric power and Mekadatu is a deep god situated at the confluence of rivers Kaveri and its tributary Akravati. So questions can be framed based on these important aspects and these must be remembered as a part of your prelims pointers. So with this discussion on this article, let's take up the next article. Now the next news to be taken up also appears in the text and context section on page number 10. Now this news highlights about the Artemis program of NASA, which is a lunar exploration program. So it highlights that Artemis 1 is first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will enable human exploration to moon and then to Mars. So the whole idea is to establish this Artemis program is not only to explore the lunar atmosphere but also to send crews firstly to moon and then to Mars and in the process also set up a gateway in the lunar orbit. So it highlights that Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed flight test that will provide a foundation for human deep space exploration and also demonstrate humankind's commitment and capability to extend human existence to moon and also beyond moon. That is to enable human exploration to Mars. And in this mission, NASA is helped by the Canadian Space Agency and also the European Space Agencies. Further, the space agencies of Japan and also Russia have shown interest in this Artemis program of NASA. So it says that NASA's Space Launch System rocket will launch along with Orion from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And during the mission of Artemis 1, Orion will venture thousands of miles beyond the moon during an approximately 4 to 6 weeks mission. Now the spacecraft will deploy a liquid oxygen or liquid hydrogen based propulsion system which will give Orion the thrust needed to leave the Earth's orbit and travel towards the moon. So these are the various stages under the Artemis program of NASA. So as a part of Artemis 1, it will be an uncrewed flight and this will help to test the re-entry of Orion's heat shield during its high speed re-entry back to Earth. Now next it highlights about PPE and HALO launch. Now PPE stands for the power and propulsion element and HALO is habitation and logistic outpost. Now these are the first pieces of the gateway. So various experiments will be conducted both from NASA and also European Space Agency as it says that both agencies will conduct early characterization of the deep space environment. Then NASA will launch the Artemis 2. It says that on this 10 day crew test flight, so humans will be on this flight. NASA astronauts will set the record for the farthest human travel from Earth and they will validate deep space communication and navigation system and they will also understand that how the life support systems keep them healthy and also safe. And lastly, Artemis 3. 
So under Artemis 3, Orion and its crew will once again travel to the moon, but this time boarding the human landing system that will bring the first woman and next man to the lunar surface. So these are some of the stages of the Artemis program of NASA. So from our examination perspective, let's go through some of the important highlights with respect to the Artemis mission of NASA. So as we have already discussed that Artemis 1 is an uncrewed space mission but eventually NASA aims to send humans on moon and also on Mars. Now during this flight the spacecraft will launch from the most powerful rocket in the world and will travel thousands of miles beyond the moon over the course for about 4 to 6 weeks. Now the Orion spacecraft is going to remain in space without docking to a space station longer than any ship for astronauts has ever done before. Further, with the Artemis program, NASA aims to land humans on the moon by 2024 and it also plans to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon as well. Now it further says that NASA's Artemis program will lead humanity forward to the moon and also prepare us for the next giant leap, namely the exploration of Mars by humans. So the moon plan of NASA through the Artemis is twofold. At the first level, the focus is on achieving the goal of an initial human landing by 2024 with acceptable technical risk. And secondly, along with landing of humans on moon, simultaneously working towards sustainable lunar exploration in the mid to late 2020s. Now NASA will also establish an Artemis base camp on the surface and a gateway in the lunar orbit to aid exploration by robots and astronauts. Now this gateway is a critical component of NASA's sustainable lunar operation and will serve as a multi-purpose outpost orbiting the moon. Now the spacecraft will fly close to the surface of the moon that is around 100 km above the surface of the moon and by utilizing the gravitational pull of the moon it will propel Orion into an opposite deep orbit around 70,000 km from the moon where Orion will stay for approximately 6 days. Now the other space agencies which are involved in the project are Canadian Space Agency and also European Space Agency. However, even the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency and Russian Space Agency has also expressed interest. So it says that the Canadian Space Agency has committed to provide advanced robotics for the gateway whereas the European Space Agency will provide international habitat and spirit module. Now this spirit module will help to deliver additional communications capabilities among other things. Whereas the Japan Aerospace Exploration plans to contribute habitation components and logistics resupply. Whereas the Russian Space Agency has also expressed interest in cooperation on the gateway as well. Further, at the lunar south pole that is of the moon, NASA and its partners will develop an Artemis base camp to support longer expeditions on the lunar surface. And this planned base camp elements include a lunar terrain vehicle or unpressurized rover, a habitable mobility platform, a lunar foundation habitation module, power systems, and also add in situ resource utilization systems. Now all these incremental capabilities and its build up around the moon is important and essential to establish long term exploration of Earth's nearest neighbor and it will also help in preparation for human exploration to Mars. So this Artemis program of NASA, especially with respect to lunar exploration, becomes an important topic with respect to science and technology and gets covered under GS paper 3. The next news to be taken up appears on page number 11 also in the text and context section. It says the nutrition fallout of school closures. COVID-19 has exacerbated the problem of child hunger and malnutrition. So this article has focused on restarting the midday meal scheme which was stopped because of COVID-19. So the author starts by saying that children must be provided sufficient nutrition through the midday meal scheme and the primary children must be provided 450 calories of food through the midday meal scheme whereas children going to upper primary school should be provided 700 calories of food as these calories intake will ensure provision for iron, vitamins, folic acid, etc. However, the point to be noted is that nutrition provided through the midday meal scheme serves only as one third nutritional requirement of a child 
So when government is not able to provide hot cooked food to children under the mid day meal scheme, they further lose this nutritional requirement. So due to COVID-19, mid day meal schemes were discontinued and equivalent food security allowance or provision for dry ration was ensured for all school going children. And this step was taken to ensure that a child gets sufficient nutrition and has a decent immunity to fight COVID-19 also. However, providing dry ration also became difficult for states to implement because of various problems, including the problem of last mile delivery. Now, the news further highlights that impact of COVID is also reflected through the Global Hunger Index as India has been ranked recently at 101. Now, hunger is generally understood to refer to the distress associated with lack of sufficient calories. So the whole aspect is that of providing sufficient nutrition and the Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations defines food deprivation or undernourishment as consumption of too few calories to provide the minimum amount of dietary energy which each individual requires to live a healthy and productive life. So because of COVID-19, hot cooked meal under the midday meal scheme could not be provided to children and this impacted their nourishment and also it impacted their immunity. Now when we talk about undernourishment, it simply means lack of sufficient intake of calories and this can result in child wasting, child stunting and child mortality. Now child wasting refers to share of children under the age of 5 years who are wasted which means who have low weight for their height and this reflects acute undernutrition. So this can be an example of wasting where it mentions about low weight with respect to height. Another impact of insufficient calorie intake is child stunting. Now it says that the share of children under the age of 5 who are stunted which means who have low height for their age and this also reflects chronic undernutrition. So stunting means that the child has not grown to the sufficient height which he or she should have grown for their age. And underweight refers to low weight of a child for their age. So wasting, stunting and underweight are signals of chronic undernourishment. And zero hunger is also one of the sustainable development goals. So through the midday meal schemes, we not only provide sufficient nutrition to our school going children, but in the process, we also try to achieve the second sustainable development goal, namely zero hunger. Now decrease in hot cooked meals provided under the midday meal scheme was also reflected through the food grain bulletin of Food Corporation of India. As it highlighted that offtake of grains under the midday meal scheme reduced in 2020 as compared to 2019, where the offtake of grains in 2019 was 281.932,000 tons and this was reduced by 22% in 2020 to 221.312,000 thousand tons. Further, 23 states and union territories also reported a decline in grain offtake from the FCI go-downs in 2020 as compared to 2019. So all these suggest that less food was cooked under the midday meal scheme. So the concerns highlighted in this article regarding implementation of midday meal schemes are first, irregular distribution of dry ration through the midday meal scheme as even providing these dry ration has become difficult for various states. The second point highlighted is that children also engaged in certain kinds of labor to supplement their fall in family income and because of this, they could not take proper nutrition. So the article highlights that such children should be catered to through the midday meal scheme. The third concern highlighted is regarding the problem of last mile delivery of dry rations as it still remains a challenge for many states. And the fourth point highlighted is that even states having good infrastructure to serve midday meal schemes, especially the hot cooked meal, also struggle to provide hot cooked meals during the lockdowns. Now as a suggestion, this article concludes by saying that new innovative mechanisms needs to be adopted to ensure that children gets proper food under the midday meal scheme. So this article highlights that local smallholder farmer can be linked to the midday meal scheme as 
these farmers can provide locally produced vegetables fruits and even cereals and these farmers can also provide the eggs to fulfill the protein needs of children so the article says that engaging these farmers to ensure proper supply of these rations for mid day meal schemes will not only help the school going children but will also transform the rural livelihood and also boost local economy of the village it will further improve the local supply chain and ensure self reliant nutrition and overall it will also help to boost farmers income now another innovative measure provided in this article is that the concept of community kitchen can also be started to provide cooked food to school going children to fulfill their nutritional needs so these are some of the alternative suggestions which has been provided in this article to ensure school going children get proper hot cooked meals through the mid day meal scheme now this topic of mid day meal scheme was discussed in detail on 19 july 2021 where we discussed a correlation between mid day meal scheme and that of stunting now this news highlighted that such children who were born to mothers who was exposed to mid day meal scheme were not stunted whereas those children who were born to mothers who were not exposed to mid day meal scheme showed signs of stunting so in this backdrop let us also revise what was discussed in this particular dns so stunting simply means that a child is too short for their age and this is mainly because of chronic undernutrition so stunting can be said to be the impaired growth and development which is faced by children and this results in their lesser height as compared to age so we can say that a stunted child is too short for their age so overall we can say that stunting is the impaired growth and development that a child experiences because of poor or chronic undernutrition repeated infection and inadequate psychosocial development now all this impacts the overall development and growth of a child now psychosocial development refers to relation between social features or factors and individual thoughts and behavior so stunting also impacts social and emotional development of a child in their growing age now after understanding about stunting let us understand about mid day meal scheme which was launched as national program of nutritional support to primary education in the year 1995 august so this scheme was launched in 1995 august as a centrally sponsored scheme and initially the scheme was launched only for primary education that is only for children who were studying in class 1 to 5th now this program was launched by the central government in 1995 august mainly to enhance enrollment of children in schools improve their retention and attendance in schools and also simultaneously improve the nutritional levels of children going to primary schools that is children attending classes from 1 to 5th further this scheme was extended to upper primary class that is children in class 6th to 8th so this scheme was extended to cover children of upper primary classes in the year 2007 and because of extension of this scheme to upper primary level the name of this scheme was changed from national program of nutritional support to primary education to national program of mid day meal in schools further this scheme was also extended to egs and aie centers now egs refers to education guarantee scheme and aie refers to alternative and innovation education so initially the scheme was extended to egs and ai centers initially for class 1 to 5th that is for primary education and later for class 6 to 8 that is for upper primary classes further the scheme also provide for certain nutritional norms with respect to improving or enhancing the nutritional levels of children and this nutritional level includes for primary children it is 450 calories and 12 g of proteins and for upper primary children 700 calories and 20 g of proteins now this aspect becomes crucial from your prelims perspective as questions can be asked with respect to the calorific norms of mid day meal scheme so please remember these bifurcation with respect to calorific norms for primary and upper primary level 
Now here you must also know about the EGS and AIE centers. Now these schemes were launched because of the failure of non-formal education which was launched in 1979-1980. Now the centrally sponsored scheme of non-formal education was introduced in 1979-80 on a pilot basis with a view to support the formal system in providing education to all children up to the age of 14 years. Now this was as per the directive principles of state policy in the constitution of India. So the non-formal education became a very important component of the overall strategy to achieve universalization of elementary education. However, this scheme failed to achieve its objective. So it says that the education guarantee scheme and alternative and innovative education that is EGS and AIE was evolved because of shortcomings of NFE in terms of very low investments, poor community involvement, problems in release of funds and several quality issues with respect to providing education. So because of the failure of non-formal education scheme, the education guarantee scheme and alternative and innovative education was launched by the government of India. So it is in this regard, the midday meal scheme was also extended to EGS and AIE centers from 2008. So it says that from 1st April 2008, the program covered all children studying in government schools, local body schools, government aided primary and upper primary schools and education guarantee scheme and alternative and innovative education centers, including madarsas and maktabs supported under the service Siksha Abhiyan. So we see a very wide coverage of midday meal schemes to provide nutritional support to children. Now regarding Sarv Siksha Abhiyan, it's a government of India's flagship program to achieve universalization of elementary education in a time-bound manner. And this scheme was also launched because of the 86th amendment of the constitution of India, which provides for making free and compulsory education to children from the age group of 6 to 14 years. And this amendment added Article 21A in the Constitution of India and also provided for Right to Education Act. So all these aspects related to midday meal schemes becomes important. Now after understanding about stunting and important highlights of midday meal scheme, let us understand about the importance of this report as this report highlights about the correlation between stunting and exposure of girls to MDM or midday meal scheme. Now this report has calculated stunting as per height for H Z score. So based on this score, this particular report has provided or highlighted the correlation between stunting and exposure to MDM for such mothers. So this report highlights that height for age Z score or has score among children born to mothers will full MDM exposure was greater than that in children born to non-exposed mothers. So a child's health was dependent on mother's exposure to midday meal scheme. Further, the report also highlights that a child's health was also dependent on women's education and also utilization of health services by such women, as children born to such women were mostly not stunted. Now the report further highlights of improvement in HAS score for mothers exposed to midday meal scheme. And the report says that MDM was associated with 13% to 32% of HAS improvement from the year 2006 to 2016. So gradually the HAS score of children born to such mother exposed to MDM improved. Further, the report also provides a correlation of HAS score with that of socioeconomic status of the women and MDM exposure together. So those women who had better socioeconomic status and who were exposed to midday meal scheme, their children were much better as compared to those women whose socioeconomic status was lower and also who did not had MDM exposure. Further, the report highlights another significant aspect. It highlights better has reports for children when birth year was later. Now, if we remember the span of this particular report was from 1993 to 2016. And it is here where the report highlights that the has score or stunting report was better when the birth year was later that it towards 2016. So it also means that coverage of midday meal scheme improved with years. 
and has report was also better for non poor households which we have already seen so this is one aspect of the report which highlights about a correlation of stunting and mdm exposure now other important highlights of this report includes poor beginnings of mdm that is mid day meal scheme now this report says that due to institutional challenges only a few states scaled up the program immediately on its launch so the mid day meal scheme faced certain institutional challenges and this institutional challenges is also reflective with respect to children born to mothers having less mdm exposure now this report further highlights that as per the national sample survey data of 1999 only 6% of all the girls aged between 6 to 10 years received mid day meal so we can say that the mid day meal scheme had a poor start because of certain institutional challenges the report further mentions about supreme court interventions as this led to improvement in mdm rollout in different states so after supreme court directions program coverage between 1999 and 2004 increased in many states now regarding the coverage for girls and boys under mid day meal schemes this report highlights that in 2004 32% of the girls in the age group of 6 to 10 years were covered under the mid day meal schemes and after substantial allocation through budget to this particular program this coverage among girls increased to 46% in the year 2011 with respect to girls in the age group of 6 to 10 years however the report says that coverage among boys was similar throughout this period so we see certain improvement with respect to coverage of girls under mid day meal schemes from 32% in 2004 to 46% in 2011 further the report mentions about state variability in mdm rollout that is differences in rolling out of mid day meal schemes in different states now this was mainly due to poor finances of the states and also lack of motivation by states to roll out the mid day meal scheme further the reports have also stated that stunting was lower in states which had high mdm or mid day meal scheme coverage so we can say that the nutrition of children in such states which had high mdm coverage was much better as compared to nutrition among children in such states which had lower mdm coverage And lastly the report also mentions about certain impact on migration. The report highlights that the estimated role of mid day meal exposure was weakened in the presence of substantial migration across states. And this can be also associated with the nutritional level of such families who migrated more as they had less mid day meal scheme exposure. Thus these can be said to be some of the important highlights for this particular report. So after this discussion the aspect of nutrition and health becomes an important part of your syllabus and as you can see questions have been asked in the mains examination by UPSC in GS paper 2 so let's go through these two questions asked in 2019 the question said despite consistent experience of high growth india still goes with the lowest indicators of human development examine the issues that make balanced and inclusive development elusive the next question was there is a growing divergence in the relationship between poverty and hunger in india the shrinking of social expenditure by the government is forcing the poor to spend more on non food essential items squeezing their food budget now both these aspects can be related to nutritional health or nutrition now the question asked in 2018 read appropriate local community level healthcare intervention is a prerequisite to achieve health for all in india explain The next question again in 2018 was how far do you agree with the view that focus on lack of availability of food as the main cause of hunger takes the attention away from the ineffective human development policies in India so we see that the aspects of health nutrition and poverty can be correlated and asked by UPSC so this report highlighting the link between exposure to mid day meal scheme and stunting of children must be viewed from the perspective of nutritional development among children and in this regard you should also know the fact and the impact of mid day meal scheme so summarizingly we can say that the mid day meal scheme aims to reduce hunger and malnutrition another important aspect of mid day meal scheme is to increase enrollment in schools and through increased enrollment to also improve school attendance now increased enrollment and improved school attendance will further lead to better mixing of students from different category of the society and will overall improve social inclusiveness 
and it will also improve girls education and their health so these can be said to be some of the benefits of midday meal scheme now there are also certain challenges to implement the midday meal scheme especially in schools across districts in india one of the major challenge or even concern is regarding the wastage of food by students which are prepared in the school now another challenge is to manage the entire mechanism of midday meal program by the teachers so because of this various teachers across the country have said that introduction of midday meal scheme has increased their workload apart from teaching as they also have to take care of the nutritional aspect of students another challenge is regarding procuring rations and also because at times funds are delayed by the state so at times teacher themselves procure certain rations and based on the receipt they receive funds from the state government now another problem faced by the teachers and students is regarding the lack of infrastructure for food storage in schools further cooking and serving of food in schools again become a problem and also this leads to unhygienic surroundings because most of the kids they waste food as we have already stated that there is certain delay in payments for food in different states further teachers have also stated that introduction of mid day meal scheme has reduced learning time among students as young students are mostly engrossed in the cooking process for the day further there are also reports of poor quality of dry rations provided by the respective state governments so these can be said to be some of the concerns and challenges with respect to mid day meal scheme now the next article to be taken up appears on page number 8 as a lead article it says global uncertainties india's growth prospects normalization of the indian economy has been disturbed and the growth objective would be served by apt fiscal policy moves now this article highlights about various global uncertainties such as increase in crude oil prices russia ukraine war and even increase in rates by us federal reserves and how will these international events impact indian economy so in this backdrop this article says that the magnitude of real gdp for india for the year 2021-22 has been 147.7 lakh crores whereas for the year 2019-20 was 145.2 lakh crores so for the year 2021-22 the magnitude of real gdp has been marginally higher and as such we cannot say that there was a v shaped recovery although indian economy witnessed a slowdown because of covid-19 for the year 2020-21 So in this regard let us understand certain future challenges which are before the indian economy due to global uncertainties now the first aspect highlighted in this article is regarding increase in crude oil prices so this article says that india is among the largest importers of crude oil and hence recent increase in the international crude oil prices would have an adverse impact on the indian economy because the government of india will have to spend more to import same amount of crude oil so higher prices of crude oil will lead to increase in cost of transportation and therefore it will also lead to inflation in the indian economy further we have also witnessed depreciation of indian rupee and this will make imports costly and combining both these aspects together this will definitely impact the indian economy now let us understand this through an example now suppose the value of 1 dollar is rupees 60 and after changes in the forex market the rupee has depreciated to rupees 80 which means the value of 1 dollar is now rupees 80 so to buy goods worth 1 dollar initially i had to spend only 60 rupees but now i have to shell out 20 rupees more now this means that the import becomes costly this means that more money will be paid for imports and it also means that the import bill for the government will also increase now we have seen that the government of india is one of the largest importer of crude oil and hence the import bill for the government will increase and overall this will reduce the forex reserve of india so rupee depreciation leads to imports becoming costly and this leads to higher current account deficit now we have a current account deficit when the value of imports exceeds the value of export so it means that the expenses on import is greater than the earnings on export so it overall says that 
Hence, higher crude oil prices can affect macroeconomic stability of Indian economy and could potentially derail the economic recovery. And according to RBI, $10 increase in crude oil prices could lead to increase in current account deficit by 0.4%. Now, increase in crude oil prices will further increase the price of fuel in India and there would be supply side bottlenecks also. So it says that sectors which are dependent on petroleum such as fertilizers, iron and steel, transportation etc. will also be affected which means these sectors which are dependent on petroleum will also become more costly. It further mentions about increase in rate of interest in US. Now it highlights that the US Federal Reserve has recently increased the interest rate by 25 basis points. Now this means that the increase in interest rate is expected to lead to higher FPI outflows that is foreign portfolio investment outflows from Indian economy and thus putting higher strain on rupee. So outflow of FPI means more dollars going out thereby putting more strain on rupee resulting in likely depreciation of Indian rupee. Now the next impact highlighted here is impact of Russia-Ukraine war. So it highlights that there are chances of escalation or increase in oil and gas prices as Russia is world's largest exporter of gas and second largest crude oil exporter as well. It further says that there are chances of increase in food prices also as Russia and Ukraine contribute significantly to global exports of wheat, maize, corn and also barley. Further. It can have an adverse impact on export of tea from India because Russia accounts for 15% of India's tea exports. And global increase in prices of base metals such as aluminium, nickel, steel could adversely impact or affect domestic manufacturing in India. So these global events will have a likely impact on Indian economy. Now the Indian policy makers faces a threefold dilemma as they must decide that who should bear the burden of higher crude oil prices? Will it be the consumer? Will it be the oil marketing companies? Or will it be the government itself? Now considering the first scenario, that is the consumer will bear the burden of higher crude oil prices. Now this will lead to increase of prices of not only petrol and diesel, but also of other associated stuffs, namely vegetables, transportation, etc. It will lead to lower disposable income of the consumers. And this will overall decrease consumer spending and hence there would be decrease in GDP growth. Considering the second scenario, that is when the burden of higher crude oil prices fall on the oil marketing companies. So in such a situation, the oil marketing companies would not be allowed to pass on the higher rates onto the consumers and this will result in losses for these OMCs. Now higher losses of these OMC would then have to be compensated by the government itself through higher fuel subsidies. Now higher fuel subsidy will further increase the fiscal deficit of the country. Considering the third scenario, if the burden falls on the government itself, then the government will have to substantially reduce the tax rates on petrol and diesel and this will lead to higher revenue loss for the government. Now higher revenue loss for the government would in turn prevent the government from undertaking expenditure to revive the Indian economy. So this is the dilemma which the Indian policy makers faces with respect to shifting the burden of higher crude oil prices. So as a way forward, there are basically two challenges before the Indian economy. These are economic slowdown and growing inflation. So it says that the government must continue to focus on reviving the Indian economy and enhancing its resilience to global external shocks. And as far as the RBI is concerned, the Reserve Bank must increase the policy rates to control the growing inflationary pressure on Indian economy. So this can be said to be a way forward with respect to the growing uncertainty because of international situations. Now this topic becomes important mainly from the perspective of Indian economy and questions can be asked in your prelims and mains examination. Now the last news to be taken up appears on page number 14. Now this news says, India's Foreign Secretary Shringla calls for alignment between United Nations and LAS. LAS stands for League of Arab States. So India's Foreign Secretary has stated that India and Arab world share a civilizational relationship and he also welcomed the normalization of relations between countries in the region and retreated India's support for a two-state solution. Now, two-state solution was asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2018. The question was, the term two-state solution 
is sometimes mentioned in the news in the context of the affairs of the options given were china israel iraq and yemen in this the correct answer was b that is israel so at the meeting of united nations security council india's foreign secretary has called for greater policy alignment between united nation and league of arab states and he has stated that this must be fostered through regular and frequent consultations further india's foreign secretary also suggested comprehensive coordination at field level and emphasized post conflict peace building via reconstruction and economic development of the african region he further suggested that all efforts must ensure regional stability with a special focus on welfare of women and minorities and also said that both organizations that is un and league of arab states must take concerted efforts to support the reactivation of the middle east peace process in line with the two state solution now regarding league of arab states which is also called the arab league is a regional organization of arab states in the middle east and north africa it was formed in cairo on 22nd march 1945 following adoption of alexandria protocol in 1944 it aims to be a regional organization of arab states with a focus to develop the economy resolve disputes and coordinate political aims of various countries now the founding members of arab league were egypt syria lebanon iraq transjordan which is now jordan saudi arabia and yemen now each member has one vote in the league council and decisions being binding only on those states that have voted for such resolution now the league's main goal is to draw closer the relations between member states and coordinate collaboration between them to safeguard their independence and sovereignty and also to consider in a general way the affairs and interest of arab countries further six countries has observer status at the league of arab states namely eritrea brazil venezuela india armenia and chad and in total there are 22 member states in the arab league so you must remember these important points from your prelims perspective regarding arab league and the fact that india enjoys observer status in the arab league Now this topic becomes important under GS paper 2 with respect to international relations and also important international institutions. So with this discussion let's take up the question for the day. Now based on our discussion this becomes your practice question for the day. The question is Artemis program is sometimes mentioned in the news in the context of options are A covid vaccine, B lunar exploration program, C two state solution and D robotics. Now coming to the answer of yesterday Here the first statement was incorrect. The question was with reference to Secretary General of Lok Sabha. Consider the following statements: He is appointed by the President of India. No, he is appointed by the Speaker of Lok Sabha and enjoys the privileges of the House. Now this part of the statement was correct, whereas the second and third statements were also correct. So it says that as the overall head of the Bureau of Parliamentary Studies and Training, he organizes studies, courses, seminars, training, and orientation program for MPs and new officers. and third statement says that when the commonwealth speakers conference is held in india the secretary general of lok sabha acts as the ex officio secretary general of the conference so the question was which of the statements given above is are correct so here the correct answer was c that is 2 and 3 since the first statement was incorrect with this we come to an end to today's discussion thank you for watching dns